It's been a cold season for cannon shooting. There's no end of cannon isn't and you'd be better off using your phone. That's what I keep hearing. That's what I keep reading. Yet I am in the and I'm left wondering. You know, about eight months ago now, I made a video called Why I Still Shoot Cannon. And in that video, I made the argument that based on all of the extremely high-end lenses Canon was putting out, it was only a matter of time before they put out a high-end body to match it. And I was right. And I was a little bit wrong. And that's what this video is about. Let's get this out of the way right at the beginning. As a photographic tool, like a strictly photo camera, the R5 is unbelievable. It's truly the best camera I've ever used. I was a wedding photographer for many, many years. And in those days, if I could have had a camera with this level of performance, I would have killed a baby giraffe to have it. But these days, I find myself much more drawn and connected to video, to filmmaking, than I do photography. And it's on that front that this camera gets a little bit interesting. I've been shooting with the R5 for a few weeks now. I've been trying to be slow and trying to collect my thoughts so that when I did present to you, uh, my audience, my friends, my lovers, <laughs> to try and articulate my thoughts on it, I, you know, I'd have an actual understanding. I would have brought it on a few proper projects, used it for some YouTube videos, done all sorts of stuff with it. But oh my gosh, there's just so much to say. So let's keep in mind that this is not going to be my full official review of the R5, just because, well A, I still need more time with it, and B, I think Canon may need to make some sort of statement or firmware update or, or something. They did. I finished this video uh, almost a week ago and then I went on a little camping trip with my family and when I got home, Canon had issued a firmware release. And when I first heard of that, I was like, no, my entire video. Um, but good news, bad news. The good news is I still get to make this video because the bad news is the overheating issues still exist, but they're better. It's still confusing though. I've been a pretty committed Canon user now for the last 10 years, so I've grown accustomed to watching this camera release cycle where they put out a camera that's somewhat under spec compared to their competition or the current market, and it gets laughed off of the internet, but then within a few months, people start to use it and they realize like, oh, these cameras are kinda great. There's something about them that's always been really enjoyable to use, and specifically the image has just been very pleasing. This was most notable with the 5D Mark III, which people said if it didn't shoot 4K, it'd be dead on arrival. And then, especially with the C300, which was released on the same day as the Red Scarlet. And when you compare it to spec, it just didn't make any sense. But both of those cameras went on to be some of the most successful cameras in a while. But more recently, we've seen a different side of Canon, which is they started to announce these cameras, especially the R5 and R6, that had the kind of specs that would bring a baby giraffe back to life. And a lot of us started getting excited, but also trying to tamper that excitement because we were kind of wondering, what's the catch? I 
as someone who loves watching product announcement live stream videos, I never miss an Apple event. I'll even watch the Samsung and the events and the Google events, the Panasonic events, and especially the Canon events. And I didn't even finish watching that announcement video because I had already loaded up Adorama or whatever and pre-ordered the R5 and the R6, hoping that this would finally be the two camera setup for me. And I had even planned on selling my C200 because of these cameras. That's not because these cameras are C200 replacements, but it's just because of my workflows are often no longer needing all of the benefits that a cinema camera offers. I mean, I, I guess I am running it right now just to have audio, so that's something. But as these reviews started coming out with all the overheating, I quickly started to feel like, oh, I don't think these could replace the C200, not because of image quality, but because they're gonna overheat and what am I gonna do if it's hot? One really nice discovery that people have made so far about the camera is that if you are recording externally to an Atomos Ninja like I am here, then the 4K HQ mode basically just won't overheat at all and you get unlimited record times. Overheated, shutting down. What? 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 I overheated it. Also, another update here is actually that the camera had overheated, even though it was recording externally, even though there was no card in the camera because the display on the R5 was still turned on. So I guess the display itself is generating heat or at least the camera needing to build the image to put it in the display is generating heat. I don't really know, but that seems like an issue that isn't so much of an issue anymore in version 1.1. So I tried testing this on a Walk Off the Earth video that we shot the other day. So I had version 1.1, I had no memory card in, I left the screen on though so that I could control autofocus, had it in 4K HQ, and it went all day, never got a heat warning, it never overheated. And so I was pretty excited until I got home and I was like, this doesn't look like the HQ, this looks like the normal 4K which is fine, you know, I actually don't mind the image, but it, it doesn't hold up to as much grading, there's more noise in the image. Turns out that because now version 1.1 supports auto heat control when you're using the HDMI, it, what it meant is that I was never recording on the camera and so it was trying to not overheat the camera by just sending out like a standby signal, which looks like the regular 4K line skipped version and it was waiting for me to record on the camera in order to jump back into HQ, but I didn't, so that's, I don't know, I don't know. So the overheating is a problem, and for a lot of people that shoot long, full production shoot days in a way that I don't often find myself doing anymore, it's gonna be even more of a problem than it has been for me. So what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do if your camera overheats and you run out of shoot time for the day? I'll tell you what you could do. You could go to our sponsor, which is Storyblocks. All right, that's not entirely true. Storyblocks isn't gonna fix an entire missed day of shooting, but it can do a lot more. Storyblocks has a massive library of hundreds of thousands of super high quality clips that you can use as many of you want in as many places as you want, all for one low subscription price. For today's video, having Storyblocks accessible to me worked out perfect because eight months ago when I shot the last video about Canon feeling like their innovation was frozen, it happened to be an ice storm outside and I could not have predicted that the next Canon mirrorless camera would come out would have such terrible overheating issues, which meant I knew that I wanted to incorporate footage to kind of like finish that narrative arc. I wanted the ice to be melting and I wanted it to go beyond melting into like overheating flaming up. So rather than scrapping the idea because it's summer in Canada and incredibly hot out, I went into Storyblocks, typed up a bunch of melting snow videos, fire starting, and I was able to fill up my edit with the kind of shots that I wanted to tell this story, but were quite frankly, completely inaccessible to me in the summer. And beyond stock footage, they have a whole lot more. They've got a wonderful sound library, they've got After Effects templates, motion templates, alpha channel elements, chroma channel elements, all sorts of things that you can use to spice up your edit. See, it's not just about, boom, here's the shot. Sometimes it's about, 
here's the shot or here's the shot, I don't know. You can do all sorts of things with that library. If you're curious to learn more, go ahead and click the link down in the description to check out Storyblocks and start making your edits a little uh, hotter. <laughs> I don't know, better, thanks. The problem isn't so much that the camera overheats, and I'll get to that in a minute. The problem is that so much of the marketing for this camera leading up to it was pretty bold in talking about its uses in professional filmmaking environments. And as it stands, that's, that's just not the case. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. It can't fit on professional sets anywhere unless it's just getting a couple filler shots here and there. It's not dependable enough for long shoot days. At least it's not dependable enough for long shoot days with the headline specs that they really led forward with in the marketing, that 8K, that 4K 120. It's tricky because the image quality of this camera in 8K is wildly good. The 4K HQ is insanely good. The 4K 120, I've even been really happy with that quality. I shot the whole intro of my last video in 4K 120 and it was all shot at 5,000 ISO in the wrong white balance by accident. And it was a little bit underexposed because we were anticipating the sun blasting through and it just didn't happen. I was still able to recover the images, lift them a bit brighter, fix the white balance and still have like amazing detail and slow motion. But if I had screwed up anything on that shoot and needed to redo it afterwards, I wouldn't have been able to because the camera gets too hot and you're done. A lot of people online see some of these criticisms about this type of camera, and they're like, if you need a video camera, buy a video camera. And here's what I'll say. I did, I already did. Um, but that's not why people buy the R5. They don't buy the R5 because, because they don't want a video camera. They buy the R5 often because of the price to performance, and then the size and the form factor. What I want, from this camera is a camera that works fantastically as a pro workhorse photography tool. But beyond that, I also want it to be a camera that we can just pick up at any time because we've got a funny idea and we just want to shoot and we're not trying to rig something out. We're not trying to make some kind of masterpiece. We just have a silly idea and we want to act on that oh impulse. And that's why mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, that kind of thing works so well for me because you turn them on, they're pretty much ready to go instantly. The C200, it takes about 20 seconds. Christoph, how long does the Komodo take to turn on? Uh, too long. Too long, he says. The point is, we've got a bunch of cinema cameras here at the studio and none of them are the right tool when you just need to grab a clip right away. <laughs> I think a very valid response to what I just said about wanting a camera that you can just pick up and grab shots is, well, there are a bunch already on the market, including the EOS R that I've been using and loving since it came out for, I don't know, two years? And while I have been quite happy with the R, I've really been trying to make a lot of my videos properly shot in 4K. But then also the headline specs of the R5 are something that I was actually really looking forward to. So take the 8K as an example. Almost no one is actually going to need 8K, but if you saw my video called Adjusting the Adjustment Layer, tips for thinking differently, something about that, I was teaching a technique on how I like composite wide shots together and will digitally move things around. And so having the 8K for those type of shots is unbelievably helpful. And, and practically this video actually, the intro shot that I matched up with the summer and the winter shots, when I shot it eight months ago, Kristoff shot it on the R on the 24 to 105. So he was actually physically zooming the lens out in order to do that pullback. But this time when I shot it, there was no one at the studio to help me pull that off. So I actually set the camera at the widest composition, put it in 8K raw, and then digitally uh, did that zoom. And at 500% zoom, I actually found the R5 looked better than the R did not cropped in at all. So. I've been digging through just so much footage, both that I've shot from the camera and then also that I've shot of me talking about the camera. And it, it's, it's, it's too much. <laughs> and I mean it's too much because the camera is still changing with the firmware update that just came, with the announcement of an incoming firmware update, bringing things like Cinema Raw Lite and 1080-120 and the C-Log3. So, it's really hard for me to give any sort of actual review 
on the camera because as a filmmaking tool right now, it just at the very least feels unfinished. I didn't buy this camera just to review it. I bought this camera as my own actual workhorse camera. So I don't plan on returning it. I plan on using it to its fullest as often as possible. So if you do have questions about it, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below and hopefully I'll either learn something from you or be able to help you out in some capacity. But for now, uh, yeah, I don't know. If you really need a super reliable filmmaking tool that has those headline specs, 8K, 4K HQ, 4K 120, I, I just don't know if it's gonna work for you. I'm gonna guess it might not, but it might six months from now, so I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. Thanks for watching. I think you're great. I think this camera could be great. I love you. Bye.